Well, uh, it's 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 now eight o'clock in Ames, Iowa, in the middle of the United States. I think it's it's around five p.m. where Jane is, um, uh, and uh, in Kenya. Uh, so I just want to welcome you all to this. I think this is our eleventh webinar of the year, uh, of the not of the year of of of, of our entire webinar series. Um, my name's Kyle Porman and I'm the Communications and Policy Manager for the Consortium for Innovation and Post-Harvest Loss and Food Waste Reduction. Um, the mission uh, of the consortium is to preserve nutrients, improve livelihoods, and re realize an efficient and effective food system. Uh, I'm so excited today to have Dr. Jane Ambuco here uh, with us from the University of Nairobi. Um, and before we get to her um, presentation on mango preservation, uh, I have to go through a few housekeeping uh, steps here. As always, <clears throat> uh, we are recording the webinar uh, and we're live streaming on YouTube. Uh, the recording will be up on our YouTube channel just as soon as we can after the webinar is finished. Uh, again, so excited. Um, to have Jane here uh, talking about <clears throat> technologies and in innovation for food loss reduction uh, for smallholders, uh, for smallholders and zero loss centers. Uh, it's a case study on the mango value chain in Kenya. Uh, if you know Dr. Ambuko, she is an expert in this field. And so I'm, I'm so excited about this presentation. Um, just a little bit about the consortium. We're made up of nine institutional members uh, uh, and two major funders, the Rockefeller Foundation and the Foundation for Food and Agriculture Research. Let me also say that each one of our institutional members are also uh, bringing their own funding to the table. So basically we have 11 funders. Uh, I just wanted to say a, a big thank you, first of all, to the University of Nairobi and Dr. Ambuko uh, for putting this uh, presentation, this webinar together. Also, I'd like to say a big thank you to the University of Maryland. Uh, behind the scenes, they're really the power in putting these webinars together. Uh, so thank you very much to those uh, institutions. A little bit about the consortium is that we have institutional members and then we have collaborators that we do our research with. Uh, a whole bunch of different types of collaborators uh, from other uh, universities uh, to NGOs uh, to businesses. Uh, so we're, we're really fortunate to have a whole host of great collaborators uh, and it's growing, um, it seems like it's growing daily. Uh, so the last webinar that we had, uh, uh, we, we, we had fewer collaborators than we did on this one. Um, so without further ado, uh, I'd like to um, uh, acknowledge and, and just lift up Dr. Jane Ambuko from the University of Nairobi and turn this webinar over, over to her. And I think she also has uh, uh, someone to introduce as well who has joined us. Uh, uh, from the University of Pretoria. So thank you, Jane. Go ahead. Okay, so... Um, so good morning, everybody. My name is Jane Amboko. I'm so glad to have you all uh, in this webinar. Um, I don't know if uh, Professor Lindiwe is has joined us. She's the one I was supposed to introduce. She's. Uh, she I is. am online. I yeah, am she's online. online. She's online. Yep. <laughs> yes, pro Professor. I told them to intro to invite you as among the panelists. Maybe you can just greet the people before I start the presentation. Thank you very much. It's an honor to participate and learn from everybody else. My name is Professor Lindiwe Majele Sibanda. I am the director and chair of the African Research University Alliance Center of Excellence in Sustainable Food Systems, hosted by the University of Pretoria, working in collaboration with the University of Nairobi and the University of Ghana. Thank you. 
pleasure to have you, Prof, and pleasure to have all the participants that are logged in. It's my pleasure to share some of my experiences in the Mango Valley chain. I know there are many experts who are logged in, so it's an experience sharing uh, webinar. So today I'm going to talk about uh, technologies and innovations for food loss and waste reduction in zero loss centers, and we'll specifically look at mango. Though sometimes uh, when you talk about mango, it represents uh, many other fruits. So the case study is mango, but it applies to other fruits. Okay, so this is the outline of my presentation. I will give a small yeah. background. Jaina, I don't know if you're sharing your screen. So did, did you mean to oh. share your screen? Yeah. Am I not sharing? You're not sharing yet, no. Oh my goodness. Okay, let me see. Share. Am I sharing now? Yes, now you're sharing. Okay, so I will go back to the beginning. Are we good? Are you, yep, you're able to good. see? Me? Thank you, Jen. Excellent. Yep. Excellent. So I had talked about the title and this is the outline of uh, the presentation. I'm gonna give a small background and then I look at how we manage quality in the Mango Valley chain from farm to shelf, and then introduce the concept of zero loss centers. And then I'll highlight some capacity building initiatives at the uh, University of Nairobi. So mango is one of the major food produced in Kenya. And I know in many tropical countries, and the reason I'm so interested in mango is because it's a, it's a, a, a crop that is grown mainly by smallholders in Kenya, and the wastage in that in this value chain are enormous. It's estimated that 40 to 50 percent is lost. Although sometimes when you interrogate the farmers, they tell you there is even more. So the actual losses vary with season, with region, and other factors. But what is reported is 40 to 50 percent. Now, when you have uh, 40 to 50 percent of produce going to waste, the question you want to ask yourself, who pays the price? Because when you see that wasted, basically it represents wasted resources, inputs into producing that those mangoes. So the question is who pays the, for that wastage along the supply chain? Now, this survey that uh, what you're seeing uh, on my screen now is a, a survey uh, results of, uh, it's just an ad hoc, uh, you know, sport check about uh, mango pricing in, in the retail stores in Nairobi. Uh, and uh, so last week I was in the field and with my mango farmers and I saw mangoes are retailing for four shillings, four cents, four US cents, which is like four Kenya shillings. So uh, you want to ask yourself, so if they're selling for four cents at the farm gate, how much are they retailing in the, you know, in the retail outlets in Nairobi? And as you can see, I did another survey in 2018. So what you see in blue are the prices of a piece of mango. And it was specifically, I went for one uh, particular variety, which is called the apple mango. So you can see uh, in 2018, you can see the prices. Uh, and I was shocked when I saw that I could actually pay 66 cents for the same mango that is, re is uh, being sold for four cents at the, at the farm gate. So this year when I went, this, 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 uh, the survey which is in red is something I did last week. And uh, I was sh even more shocked that the same mango now retails for 96 cents, right? So when you see that wasted that we just pointed out, it tells you that you know, there is a cost to it. And if farmers are being paid four shillings and they are the producers, and you're paying 96 shillings or cents and you're the consumer, you're paying the price. The traders, when I interrogate them, they said, you know, there's a lot of waste. We waste a lot. A lot of mangoes that come from the farm uh, don't get to the market or they're not sold because there's a lot of wastage. And that's why they can't pay more. So it tells you that the farmer essentially has to pay for that wastage that we're seeing in the marketplace or along the supply chain. And then you and me as the consumer, if you have to eat mango, you're gonna pay more. But you, you and me as the consumer, you can say, well, if it's that expensive, I'm not gonna buy. But what about the farmer who has produced, they do not have a choice to say no. So either they take the four shillings or let it rot away in the farm. Now that is the dilemma. That's the challenge that uh, we have to address, right? So when we talk about food loss and waste in the supply chain, uh, basically, this is a supply chain. If there's a, some wastage or some loss occurs at each and every one of these stages. Yeah. So the question you have to ask yourself is uh, how much loss occurs at the various stages? And 
how what 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 are the factors what are the factors what are the causes of the losses at each of these stages and thirdly is there any way we can minimize losses at this at all these stages what technologies are there if there are any to address the factors that contribute to losses at all or at the various stages of the supply chain so when you look at the drivers and causes there's what happens pre-harvest and what happens after harvest. So I won't talk too much about pre-harvest, but it's important to know that whatever happens in the field significantly affects the, first of all, the yield, the quality of the produce, which then we have to handle after harvest. So the focus today is on post-harvest, but we are cognizant of the fact that whatever happens in the field really affects the quality. Just to emphasize that, eh, we say, if you're going to have produce that is of good quality. We have to maximize, optimize the production practices. We must optimize the harvest practices. And then when we have harvested the produce, it must be handled properly to ensure that we, we the produce is preserved. And then when it comes to us, the, the, now in the post-harvest part of the supply chain, we can only preserve the quality. So we cannot add quality, but just preserve. So everything that happens before we step in as post-harvest experts must be right, okay? So just to emphasize that, so basically this is what I'm saying that uh, the choice of variety for the intended use in the target market, the water and nutrient management, pest and disease management in the orchard, the cultural practices that ensure that your, 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 your orchard is neat, as you can see, thinning and pruning, those must be done right because those impact on the quality, as you can see. Now, this photo I'm, I'm showing you uh, uh, when it comes to pests and diseases is one of the major factors that contribute to the wastage uh, or the spoilage of mangoes when they're harvested. So you find, for example, in Kenya, one of the biggest challenges we have in the mango valley chain is fruit fly, okay? And the mango weevil. Now, those two pests have actually cost us the export market. Farmers cannot export because uh, of the phytosanitary standards re regulations to our target markets in Europe and US because of the mango weevil and the mango fruit fly. Now, last week, as I told you, I was in the field and the farmers gave me, uh, uh, I, we were doing a training and the farmers gave me a whole crate of mangoes. Okay, as a gift, uh, because of uh, you know me as having gone there. Now I brought those mango to my house, and they were good, very good looking at the farm level. Uh, and then I, you know, they were not ripe, so I kept them in the you know in the store to ripen. But would you believe half of those I couldn't eat because half of them had a good number of them had mango weevil, a lot of them manifested the anthracnose. So some of these diseases or pests you may not see that when uh, you pick the produce, but they manifest later in the, in the supply chain. So that's why I'm saying managing pests and diseases in the field is critical if you're going to have quality fruits that have to meet the market requirements. Then of course we have the harvest practices. I don't know about uh, the other countries represented here, but it's common practice when you go to the, to the farms, the way they harvest the fruits already it, 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 it leaves a lot to be desired. Sometimes you find the, the true trees are so tall, so they simply shake the trees and the fruits fall off the tree. Or somebody climbs into the tree and harvests the fruits and throws them down to the ground. What, does, what impact does that have? You may not even see that the fruit is injured, but that injury will manifest itself later in the supply chain. That's why sometimes you find a good looking mango, later in the sub, when you cut it, you find it is you know, it's rotten inside. It's because the practices, uh, you know, the proper, I mean, the poor handling, uh, harvest practices and handling practices. Then we have the, how do we handle the fruits after they're harvested? Now the picture you can see is a common uh, scenario you find in the field. You know, the fruits are harvested, they're just kept on the ground under, you know, under the tree. And uh, you can see already, uh, apart from just uh, poor handling that inflicts a mechanical injury, you can see uh, this fruit uh, in terms of safety, they're not good. So if you're targeting certain market, there's some germs, the contamination that the fruits pick when they handle like this. So all these factors, we have to take care of them because quality, like I said, uh, preservation of quality does not start when the produce arrive at the zero loss centers. It starts all the way from the field. So it's when you get these fruits which are 
contaminated like this, that means when they come to your, you know, to the center, the zero loss center that I'm going to talk about, you know, they start rotting because of the germs or the contamination that occurred prior to them coming to the, to the center. Okay, so basically what you're saying is before the produce comes to the, what we're calling the zero loss aggregation centers, good management practice have been done pre-harvest and that harvest stage and the immediate handling before they come to the center so that whatever comes to the, the zero loss center is good quality mango fruits, which we then want to preserve the quality of, okay? So the concept of zero loss center here basically is first, like I said, and I repeat this over and over again, that high quality fruits must come to us, must come to the aggregation center or the zero loss center. Now when those fruits come, it means each and every one of those fruits is gonna be put in use, right? So some are going to be sold fresh and those are the ones who want to ensure that the quality is preserved using the technologies I'm gonna talk about. But whatever is not preserved for the fresh market can be processed into, uh, we shall see, what we call wet processing or dry processing. Um, and then whatever uh, we have like a byproduct products or waste that is coming from the processing can also be put into alternative use. So instead of throwing it in the garbage bin, it can also be utilized to make other useful products as we shall see, okay? So I'm gonna talk, so the post-service technologies and innovations are the zero loss centers. Now we have technologies for extending the shelf life. Now there are many technologies. We need a week to just talk about those technologies. So today I'm gonna focus, <laughs> I'm just gonna focus on cold storage technologies, but uh, not that I, I, um, I, have, um, I don't, uh, appreciate the other technologies, but because I know cold chain management is one of the weak links in the perishable produce uh, handling, okay? So I'm gonna talk about what we've been doing uh, on uh, cold uh, storage technologies. And then of course you have technologies for uh, processing, small scale, small scale processing. Like I said, in the zero loss centers, whatever is not sold as fresh produce can be uh, you know, value added into produce that can then be sold instead of it being uh, unsold. Because you realize when mangoes are overripe, nobody's gonna buy them. But what happens to those mangoes? If you don't have any capacity to value add, then you must have, you, they'll go to waste. So those are the kinds of wastage and losses we try, we try to avoid at zero loss centers, okay? So what you have there is an array of technologies for preservation of quality. I'm putting them, this, them all of them like this because all of these technologies, we have had research on them. Students have done thesis on them. So now they're ready. For us, we have evidence to go and promote them. Okay, so but like I said, I will zero down just to the cold storage technologies because, uh, like I said, uh, temperature management is a weak link when it comes to managing uh, quality of perishable produce. Now, why is it a weak link? You can see at the center what causes the produce to ripen and eventually spoil. There are many factors. Those of us who are in post harvest, we know these pro uh, processes that continue. We say that. Uh, harvested produce, mango or fruits and vegetables are living, okay? So they continue. So all we do, we say post-harvest actually is the science of prolonging death, okay? They continue to respire, they continue, you know, to, you know, to, to transpire. So we minimize or reduce the rate of those uh, uh, processes, right? So for every 10 degrees increase in temperature, the rate of spoilage increases two to threefold. Okay, so that basically tells you if you minim if you handle your produce at the safe low temperature, then you can increase their shelf life. So that's why I'm gonna narrow zero down on uh, uh, um, uh, technologies for cold storage because uh, uh, of the importance in managing or handling uh, fresh or per perishable produce like mm -hmm. mango. Okay, so what have we done? What are we doing at the University of Nairobi in terms of low cost cold storage, which I'm gonna talk about. There are three of them. This is our innovative cold storage technology demo and training unit at the University of Nairobi. So far, we have three kinds of technologies and we have four in the offing, which we are hoping to receive sometime soon from the University of Brunel. So I'm gonna unpack each and every one of these. Now, starting with the charcoal cooler, which is a technology that has been here for long, okay? Uh, it is, uh, the, one, the photo you can see on the extreme right is the original design of charcoal cooler. And uh, with this kind of charcoal cooler, it has a, 
uh, the one that we had at the very beginning, it has a wooden frame. Of course, the charcoal cooler, basically you have a charcoal that is uh, held in by a, what we call double wall made from uh, chicken wire. So the, the very traditional one is made from chicken wire and the frame is, is, is secured in place with wood. Now the challenge with that is that with time this wood rots, okay? And the chicken wire also rusts. So what our engineering people, I don't know if they're in the audience, I have a team of uh, two engineers, Dr. Duncan Bunge and Mr. Mochoni. What they have done is to improve on this uh, original design. Now what we have there, the first improvement they did is to re replace the wood with galvanized uh, aluminum. So now the issue of rotting wood was taken care of. But they went further and said, okay, fine. Though we have a galvanized uh, frame, uh, it's still not a very strong structure because the, the chicken wire can still rot. Uh, rust. So what they have done lately is to uh, introduce the fiberglass wall. So you can see the last picture in, 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 in you can see there is now the, the reinforced structure that is uh, where the walls are made from fiberglass. Now the beauty of this is that the structure is very strong and it's very clean inside as opposed to the naked charcoal. So that hygiene, uh, hygiene issues are taken care of. And then the beauty of their design is because they have worked on this for some time, they have the, uh, what they're calling a modular design. For example, if today you wanted a charcoal cooler of uh, three by three, they can quickly put it together for you because they have those designs in place. So they can custom make for uh, for 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 you if you want the whatever size that you want. And the ongoing research, of course, one of the questions that we've been asked when you're promoting charcoal cooler is that uh, you know charcoal cooler. Uh, means uh, you have to cut down trees to get the charcoal that is going to be used in the charcoal cooler. So what are the alternatives? So what uh, what we are now doing, uh, the research that we're currently doing in partnership with the Massachusetts in, uh, Institute of Technology, MIT, is to find alternatives to charcoal because basically all that charcoal does in evaporative cooling is to hold water. Because remember the principle of evaporative cooling, so I've not I've elaborated on that because of time, it's just water evaporating, hot air passing through a medium, which could be charcoal uh, or uh, sand, as you shall see in the next technology, so that the air that gets in the inside of the charcoal cooler is humid and cool. Okay, so what you, the research you are currently trying to, to do uh, to, is to explore an alternative inert material for charcoal so that then you can have, uh, you know, what you'd call then environment friendly uh, cooling system. The beauty of this uh, charcoal cooler and the one that I'm talking about, uh, the, the zero energy brick cooler that you are now seeing in your, in, in, in your slide is they are off grid. They don't need electricity. They, you know, so they are very appropriate for farmers in the rural areas. Uh, in Africa, we know electricity in the rural area is a challenge. So with or without electricity, you can have these technologies. And uh, we have uh, solar powered pumps that are used to, uh, you know, to pump water, uh, you know, because you can see water is, is supposed to circulate uh, and continue to be evaporated for us to have the cooling effect. So back to the brick cooler, again, just like the charcoal cooler, the original design that you can see here is uh, has a wooden frame. Uh, and of course, again, just like in the charcoal cooler, this is prone to rotting. So what has happened is that uh, the engineering team, what they did is to improve on this so that the frame that is uh, is now wood was original wood. Now we have the frame that is made from galvanized aluminum, making it less um, prone to rotting, uh, like uh, as opposed to the wood. And then the unit that is on your extreme right is the latest model of the brick cooler that we have. And the beauty of this one is we're improving, uh, we're using special bricks, which you can see which are better than the ones that you see in the first and second photo. And uh, the, 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 the innovation in this one is that the, the unit is reinforced with steel rods. And why is that important? It's because our traditional or original um, charcoal cooler or rather brick cooler, uh, you can see the size is small. You can't build it higher because basically you interlock the, the bricks. So you can't build it higher because it, it could collapse. But now the improved design that we have here, uh, it has reinforced uh, steel roads. So it can stand higher. So the reason that we want to look at going forward is how tall can we build this brick cooler? 
because it's even cheaper than the charcoal cooler. So that is our the latest innovation now. The beauty of the two, the charcoal cooler and the brick cooler, they're totally off grid, and that's what we promote. That's what we're promoting for smallholder farmers in the rural areas. <laughs> Now we have the cool board again. Another innovation is not ours. This innovation is actually a US innovation, which uh, our university of Nairobi team uh, adopted or did adaptive research and uh, introduced it to Kenya, as I mentioned in the earlier slide. And uh, it is very fair. This is just as good as any cold room that you can use. Uh, the innovation here is the cool board. What it does, it actually overrides the, the thermostat of the AC so that you set your temperatures on the cool pot and for example if I want uh, four degrees C which is a good temperature maybe to store tomatoes you achieve your temperature and you store your produce there so it's actually uh, you can control temperature unlike the case of the evaporative cooling where you can't control temperature it's actually passive cooling in this case for the cool pot you can regulate the temperature and it gives you as much cooling effect as as, as the conventional cold room at a fraction of the price so so, so far, this uh, unit that we have here, uh, the cost of installing it is between $6,000 to $7,000. And our idea is to find alternative insulation material so that we can bring this cost much lower because still $6,000 is way above uh, uh, the means of smallholder farmers. <laughs> So we have this one, I won't talk too much about it, is a new one, is solar powered uh, refrigerated uh, uh, box, which is an innovation from Brunel University. And uh, we, we're working in partnership with Brunel University. We're looking forward to, do conduct, uh, to conduct adaptive studies soon to see how it works so that then we can have sufficient evidence to also promote it as an off-grid technology for smallholder farmers, especially in rural areas. Now, the other technologies, of course, like I mentioned, which can extend shelf life, like I said, I won't dwell too much in them. Uh, on them, we have modified atmosphere packaging, waxing, 1MCP, hexanol, and other technologies that we have. That the four that I mentioned, our team at the university has worked on them. Students have graduated with thesis showing how effective these technologies are. And I'm just gonna share, uh, no, if I get to share the research evidence, uh, I just thought I'll share this photo. One of my students was looking at waxing as a way to uh, preserve the quality of mango fruit. You can just see with evidence there, the unwaxed fruit, they, they have shriveled. And while the waxed ones are really looking nice and still firm. So that is just how effective uh, these technologies are. And like I said, for us, for us to promote, we have we have sufficient evidence from the lab. So how effective uh, is uh, the the cold storage technology that, that I mentioned before? How effective are they to cool? And then how effective are they to slow deteriorative processes and uh, preserve quality? So I won't even go into that, but you can rest assured that we have evidence from the lab that in fact, these technologies are very effective. Just to mention uh, for, for in, in terms of cooling efficiency, we can see the charcoal cooler and the brick cooler. These are studies from one of the, some of the students. You can see how effective uh, uh, you know, the charcoal cooler and the brick cooler are, because here you have them being compared to, um, uh, you know, ambient room conditions. And what we have found from our research is that with uh, the charcoal, I mean, with the evaporative cooling te uh, technologies, you can achieve a temperature difference between the, the outside and the inside the chamber between four to 15 degrees uh, uh, centigrade temperature difference. And that, if you remember what I talked about, uh, uh, you know, the fact that for every 10 degrees increase in temperature, uh, the spoilage increases two to threefold. So even that small difference is 10, uh, four to 15 degrees, that is our evidence. It all depends on the, the time of day and also uh, and, uh, and the weather or the season. Like I said, you can't control temperature in the evaporative cooling. It's passive. It all depends on the, how hot it is outside and how humid it is. So the efficiency is dependent on that. So you can see on the lower graph is showing humidity. You see one of the factors you saw in the previous slide, I showed factors that contribute to losses and wastage in the perishable produce is uh, water loss. So with evaporative cooling, you have, have uh, high humidity, which then minimizes water loss from the produce and therefore preserve the quality. Uh, for, this brick, uh, for the cool pot, uh, 
technology, you can see how effective it is to first of all lower the temperature and then preserve, I mean, maintain those temperatures throughout storage. And then you can have your produce actually stored and preserved at, uh, at, uh, at that cold storage. Uh, as you can see in this, in this slide that I'm sharing, this is evidence from one of the students that shows um, proper cold chain management, which involves the use of the technologies I've just shown and poor cold chain management. What you can see there is if you harvest your fruits at uh, say, uh, these fruits in this study were harvested at what you call mature green, without cold storage, by day 15, you have to throw the fruits. But you can see with the cold storage, even until day 33, you still have your produce that is still good and sellable. So basically what you're saying is that with cold storage, you can achieve, uh, you can maintain quality for a longer period. And what that means for the farmers is one, you don't have to sell, you can preserve your quality for longer as you source for the market. And like when you have just uh, without any uh, cold storage, then within, if you harvest at mature green, that is the earliest maturity, physiological maturity for mango, then without any kind of uh, cold storage, it, you, can, you when you're waiting for them to ripen, it can only buy you 12 days and then it goes to spoil. Uh, again, evidence from research, uh, preservation of quality, which I mentioned, this is in the case of vitamin C, you can see that uh, waxing, which is coupled with the uh, cold, store, uh, cold storage, you can preserve the quality and maintain the vitamin C, as you can see, much longer compared to when you have your produce that is stored at uh, ambient room conditions or without waxing. Again, here, uh, modified atmosphere, you can again see vitamin C preserved. You can see the storage, the fruits actually prolonged, the shelf life prolonged to as long as 40 days when you cap on uh, cold storage with modified atmosphere packaging. So this is just to show you that um, cold storage, of course, technology, some technologies would work, but when you have cold storage, then you have uh, the synergy, uh, more effective uh, storage or quality preservation. Okay, so what does it mean for the smallholder ultimately? It basically means if the, this smallholder farmers have this kind of technologies to extend shelf life, they can aggregate their produce. Because remember, most of our farmers, uh, their produce is very small quantities. So I can't even tell a smallholder farmer to buy a cold room or even to invest in a cold room because the, the quantity or the amount of their produce cannot even justify the, the you know, the investing in the, this kind of technology. But when they're organizing groups and they are able with this kind of technology, they are able to aggregate and therefore attain the quality, the quantity uh, and consistent that consistently that is demanded by the bulk buyers. Then of course, as a group, they can negotiate for better prices. The reason you find that they're selling their mangoes for four shillings is because they do not have any bargaining power because the traders go straight to them and they tell them anyway, even if you don't sell to me, it's going to go to waste anyway. So the farmers are basically, the reason they sell for that uh, small, for the small amounts of money they do is because they are basically at the masses of the traders. Okay, but if they are empowered in this way with the, these kinds of technologies, then they can actually uh, work as a group and negotiate for better prices. That is the value proposition for these kinds of technologies. And then so basically there's no pressure to sell because I can tell you if you are a mango farmer or any other perishable produce farmer uh, for that matter, when your produce matures or ripens, you either sell for whatever you're given or it will go to waste. So you, you are under pressure to sell. But if you have this kind of uh, facility, you are not under any pressure to sell. You can actually uh, store and sell later. But most importantly, you can, uh, not importantly, but uh, additional to preserving uh, under cold storage to sell later, you can also do value addition. This is again, part of what we, we are promoting at zero loss centers. So I won't talk too much about processing because I said I'll narrow, I'll zero, I'll focus myself because of time, I'll focus only on the cold storage. But I just need to highlight that if produce is not sold, it can actually be processed. Uh, we have dry processing and we have wet processing. I'll show you some of the, the in a, in a, in a, a, a quick, I'll quickly show you some of the technologies that we can use to uh, do value addition uh, for mango and have uh, these products that you can see in the slide in the in the in the 
and then pull it below. You can make all kinds of products from mango uh, as a way of minimizing uh, wastage at zero loss centers. Now we have at the university, at the University of Nairobi, what we've been trying to do as we talk about uh, value addition to at, at zero loss centers, we are trying to build capacity of the farmers so that, uh, and, and processors so that they can do value addition. Value addition is not just dry. Because uh, you have seen some of us, if you come from Nairobi, you have seen some products in the market. They are dried, but they are not, I can't buy because the quality is is very, is not good. Okay. So, what you're trying to do at uh, this uh, food processing hub, which is supported also still by the Rockefeller Foundation and the Foundation for um, Food and Agricultural Research, is to build capacity of processors so that they pro process products that can meet the requirements of the market and sell. Because if you produce, uh, you uh, process products that don't sell, you haven't made any difference to the problem. You, you know, because it's just an expensive waste because you spend resources to add value or to process a product that you won't sell. So it's important that if you do value addition, you do it properly. And that's why we have the food processing hub to train processors. Okay, so if for mango, um, you can see with those kinds of uh, small scale processing facilities, we are training farmers to make all kinds of products. And uh, these are just some of the products that you can make from mango. Yeah, you can have, you can see the mango wine has been one of the, in quotes, flagship products because people really got interested, people didn't know that uh, wine does not only come from grapes. You can actually get very high quality wine from mango and this wine product, we're still trying to get a certification for it, but it's a, it's a, a, pro, a product that everybody is looking for from our food processing hub. But apart from that, you can make juices, you can make mango enriched yogurt, you can make jam, you can make dried products as you can see in that photo over there. And then like I said, when you have a zero loss center, so you have preserved for fresh market, you have done value addition to get uh, products that you can sell, uh, you know, processed products. But now our new activity that we're doing with the people from the animal production uh, or animal nutrition team, uh, because one of my colleagues, I, I believe she's in the, in the, in, 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 among the participants, she's called Dr. Joyce Mahina. And she told me that uh, she came to me and told me, you have a lot of wastage from mango. Can we do something with the peel and the and the kernel from the mango. I had never thought about it that way. Uh, of course, for me, what I was encouraging the farmers is to compost uh, the peel and the in the waste peel and the in the kernel so that uh, you know they can use it as compost manure. But then we now have a new thing coming from animal uh, nutrition people telling us that you know uh, uh, you can actually use the peel and the kernel to make and more fit. So this is the work that we have just started with the, with the, in partnership with the team from Animal Nutrition. And we, we, are, we are excited to see how better will the, they say that the yolk will be better uh, because of the yellow color from the mango. So that is work in progress. When we get these results, I will be so glad to share it. Okay, that is just to tell you that we can do the zero loss center is about adding value to each and everything that comes to the zero loss center. Okay, so what have I said in a nutshell? What I've said is that with these technologies, you can see at every stage of the supply chain, of the value chain, uh, there's all these, uh, when produce come to the zero loss center, this technology for, uh, you know, handling and grading the crates. We have technologies for pre-cooling. We have technologies for cold storage. We have technologies for extending the shelf life. We have technologies for value addition, whether it is wet or, or dry processing. And then we have now moving into valorization, adding value to the waste so that it doesn't just go to the dustbin. So basically, we are not just talking. We have done this practically with the farmers. So we have aggregation centers in two locations, two counties in, in Kenya, Karurumo uh, in Embu County and a place called Masi in Machakos County. And we're working with WFP to scale, to use these technologies, the charcoal cooler, the brick cooler. Now we have introduced them at marketplace in a county called Trukana because we have a lot of wastage also at the marketplace. And so we have two markets where we introduce this technology and our goal is to see this scaled to every county and beyond. Okay, so our capacity building initiative, like I said, 
said, we want to train uh, the small scale farmers and processors to do value addition of produce. So at the food processing hub, this is what goes on. Uh, I told you last week I was training. This is what goes on at our food processing hub, value addition of mango. So we have all kinds of products from mango. And then we have this unit at a, another at our, at our campus again to train uh, not just our students because they have to uh, be practitioners when they go out. So they get to learn about these technologies firsthand at the university. This is new, uh, but also we do demonstration for practitioners in the field. So our goal is to bring the potential users to come and see what is on offer and how which one of them they can adapt. And like I said, we have our engineering people on, on call. If you want it, they can find for you in a minute. So thank you for listening. These are our research partners, research and uh, funding partners. Um, uh, as you can see on this on, on this slide, I won't uh, verbalize. You can just see who they are. So we're looking for more partners because we are in this for the long haul. Thank you so much for listening to me. I think after the Q&A, I have a one final slide, which I need to, uh, uh, you know, um, it, uh, announce some two events that are coming soon uh, that, that will happen after this uh, the Q&A session. Thank you so much for listening to me. Sorry, uh, it was pretty long, but I hope you learned something. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Um, I don't know. Um, maybe you can uh, first, before we go to the Q&A, just announce those those two events coming up, uh, just because it, it, it kind of makes sense that that you can just announce that to the to the group now and then and then we'll go into the Q&A. So that, that would be good for Excellent, me. excellent. Okay, so um, I just wanted to, uh, so like I said, we are in the business of capacity building and we want to do this all over. So in the, in the month of May, uh, we're planning a five day course. Uh, this is offered under uh, a project that is called capacity building in security uh, in food security for Africa, Cal's Food Africa project, which is under Arua, uh, which uh, Professor Lee Diwe is here. I'm glad that she's here. Uh, she's, uh, she, she's, like I said, this, she's uh, the director of the Center for Sustainable Food Systems. Uh, so this online course, I want to announce that uh, soon, uh, you'll be getting more information soon uh, uh, so that you can register to join. It will be a, a five-day course with the online theory session, a practical session, where you'll get to see some of those things that I've just talked about in, our, in, in, in the presentation, uh, the practical training on value addition and uh, post-harvest handling at the unit that I, meant, I showed you. And then we'll have a field trip where we take uh, you to the, you know, through the, to, to the one of those uh, smallholder aggregation centers to actually see practical application of those technologies. Uh, that is one. If I'm announcing. And then the second uh, upcoming event that I'm going to announce is the third All Africa Post Harvest Congress and Exhibition. It's coming in September. And again, uh, the call for papers is open. So the website is uh, right there. I might share it in the chat box. It's www aaphce.com uh, that is coming in September. So look out if you're a researcher, you, if the call for papers is open. Uh, so please uh, join us also in that event where we showcase beyond what you've discussed here, there's more so that we see what is happening in this field of post-harvest uh, management in the African context. Thank you so much, Kyle. Thank you, Jane. And uh, you know, I met Jane at the uh, for the first time uh, at the All Africa Second All Africa Congress. I'm looking forward to the third one. So that's 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 excellent. So um, we have uh, a number of uh, questions, but I encourage you to uh, use the Q and A feature um, or the chat. But the Q and A feature is uh, maybe a little bit better. Uh, so I'm I'm going to facilitate the. Uh, 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 questions. Um, and uh, uh, first of all, I, I think uh, we have uh, Betty Kibara as a, from the Rockefeller Foundation um, as, a, as a participant. And I'm just going to ask Nicholas, uh, could you allow Betty to use her mic and, and camera? And, and we'll ask another question while we're working that out, okay? Sorry about that. Um, but but from uh, Mario uh, from from Brazil, we have a question. Um, uh, are are there actions being developed for the use of natural substances with antifungal um, 
action for edible coatings in 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 mangoes. I, we we had a an edible coatings uh, a webinar just uh, just a, about a month ago. So uh, so are, are there is there that research going on, Jen? Uh, basically, uh, at our in my team, we don't have that kind of research going on. But I know I have colleagues uh, from the department of, uh, in my, in our university department of food science, who've been trying to look at, uh, uh, you know, natural or what you call biological uh, control, I mean, uh, preservatives eh, for post harvest. So I, I can't talk uh, authoritatively about this because I'm not involved in that research. But yes, there are people now, there's a, you know, a shift towards uh, natural products. Uh, in preservation of quality. So um, yeah, that is possible. And uh, it's something that is there. Uh, I just don't, we haven't worked on uh, this kind of uh, innovation in our team. All right, thanks. Thanks on that. Um, uh, Betty, are you, can you? Uh, you yes, uh, okay. yes, am I unmuted? I can't tell whether I'm unmuted. You're, you're unmuted. Uh, I can hear you. Yes. All right, cool. Uh, yes, my name is Betty Kibara um, and I'm a director at the Rockefeller Foundation, uh, leading some aspects of our food initiative. And uh, Jane Amuko and the team have worked with us uh, very well from when we started conceptualizing the, um, uh, the zero loss centers. And uh, I think for me, my key takeaway is that first, uh, the University of Nairobi, you guys have done a good job. Uh, but I think our observation then was that once you, you have saved, uh, you have reduced the losses, you have all these great products. I think the biggest challenge has been, uh, you know, aggressively marketing the products and finding someone to buy it because the utilization of the aggregation centers, and especially by the uh, the brokers or the middlemen, they hardly actually use uh, the, the, the aggregation centers. And so if, if you think about who is this who is using the aggregation centers, mostly these are more formalized SMEs who want to uh, take the, 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 the mangoes for processing. And uh, for example, the, the very high end um, SMEs who are processing, for example, the banana flower or, or dried mango. So I think for me, as, as we replicate this model, we must really have a very, very strong component around engaging with even the market, even starting with the market, for example, uh, looking at who can do the mango wine as an off taker, who can do the dried uh, products, not just one company, uh, but, but many of them. So I think Jane and your, and your team and anyone who is, um, who is going to take this forward, please let's just focus on drying, making sure that we are driven by the market uh, and the product. Um, I think that's one comment. My second comment is that we also have an opportunity to have zero loss centers, uh, but uh, located where the, the the, the brokers or those who manage, who are consuming, are taking a lot of volume from the farmers. And we we are piloting something very close to what I'm saying, uh, where the association of mango traders have come together, members of the association have come together and we have helped them to set up um, a processing plant, uh, but within the city. So I think let's also think about different models and different configurations uh, for, for zero loss centers, but overall very good job by Jane and your team. We are very excited about the work. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. Great to hear from you. Yes, I think I, just to add on what Betty is saying, I, like I said, uh, when uh, we ventured into the, the, the aggregation Hypothesis then was we are solving a logistic problem for traders that you know traders like when they go to look for mangoes from uh, from the farmers you see the farmers are small hole and they're scattered everywhere so you know they have to go pick a small volume here and a small volume there to eventually have a like you they come without a lorry with like a seven ton or ten ton but the time they have to get the ten tons it is a, a few days in the field so the thinking then was we have aggregated the produce for you. So you simply come and you pick the produce. So you should be able to pay a little more. That was, you know, for me, it, it was a, it was no brainer, but you were shocked that these traders actually shun the aggregation centers because they know these farmers will want more than what they usually 
pay them when they pick from them individually at the farm. So that's why, like Betty is saying, you know, the idea of working with the traders also, so that you know, for example, if this trader wants a, a certain variety of a certain quality, so you work with them to aggregate that produce they want. So that when they come, they pick what they ask you to aggregate, as opposed to just aggregate. For us, we're thinking about aggregating quality. And you'd imagine that uh, you know everybody will be ready and willing to pay for quality. But that is not the case. So the, the model, like Betty is saying, is to go back and say, you know what? We need to work with the traders so that we aggregate for them. So that they, they, there's no negotiation beyond, uh, you know, like uh, they refuse because the, the farmers who now just have produce and they're hoping to, you know, get good value from the traders are still suffering because they are shunned by the traders. So that is the challenge that we have had with uh, when you try to pilot this. But of course, going forward, we are looking at it from a different uh, perspective. And that's why the model we're adopting now with the WFP for traders is like we, the, the, uh, the, the people, they're the users of the technology so that this is theirs they bring produce from wherever they they hold it at the at the at the at the marketplace in the cold room and so it is for them not for them they're reducing like betty said there's a lot of waste in the marketplace so they when they bring produce to the market they don't lose it there so that means that also that should cascade down to the farmer because if they're not going to lose at the market then there's value to say that you know they want they should be able to pay a little more that is also an assumption but well time will tell if that will work thank you thank you betty thank you jane uh we have a question from uh deirdre um talking about are there any disadvantages to using the cold bot compared to regular cold room uh, for example is the relative humidity lower or do the air conditioners have a shorter life Okay, so uh, in terms of for the cool for the air conditioner, basically, uh, the, with the cool board technology, there are various uh, air condition conditioners that have been used. Uh, so first of all, when you're using it, you have to you know get an air conditioner that is compatible with the cool board. And yes, like uh, like uh, uh, I can't remember the name. You said that uh, there's a disadvantage with them. So how to, to what we have done? Because the first time we introduced the cool board in Kenya, we didn't know about that disadvantage because it's forced air. So the produce gets to be you know it it makes the produce shrivel. Though it is uh, cool, but you see it is uh, you know. Uh, enhancing water loss from the from the produce because it's dry air. So what we how we got around that? Remember what I mentioned uh, uh, in the in my presentation. The complementarity, like now when it works, then you you help the produce. The produce is not prone to water loss that is uh, occasioned by the you know forced air that passes over the produce. And then the other thing we have done, like in the, cause we have now these units in three locations. What we've done is uh, uh, introduce, uh, uh, you know, a damp or a wet uh, uh, rag or sack in the cold room to increase the humidity in the cold room. Because like you said, it's true because of forced air, water tends to evaporate from the produce. But of course, waxing would help to deal with that uh, problem. And then one of my students did uh, modified atmosphere packaging, which then, you know, modified atmosphere, it, uh, you know, increases humidity around the produce. So then you, 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 you complement the, cool, the cooling uh, with the cool bot with modified atmosphere, then you have uh, uh, better results. Okay, so, the, so, so you, you have a lot of lessons learned, basically, in, in implementing this 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 technology. Exactly. Um, I just want to uh, add, add a question from from me: is 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 the cool butt just cheaper in general? Is that is that the is that the idea, right? To or than a traditional cold room. Yeah, basically, uh, like, like uh, the, the actually the technology. When you come to the cool board cold room, it has three components. There's the cool board, which is the the technology, the innovation. Uh, it costs like three hundred dollars. Okay, mm -hmm. then you have the insulated room, which you heard me say we're trying to see how can we uh, find alternative insulation so that we can bring down the cost of the room. Okay, so there's the insulation of the room, and then there's the AC. Okay, so those three components together, the the price is between like six to seven thousand dollars. Okay, which is actually cheaper anyway than a cold uh, your conventional cold room. 
okay so basically for the cool bot and then uh, the other thing with the with the with the cool bot cold room uh, is that uh, the energy consumption is lower than your conventional cold room so those those are the advantages of the cool bot cold room but of course it has uh, like somebody said disadvantages so you have to see how to navigate around those disadvantages so that you make this uh, what would otherwise affordable technology also useful for the end users um uh we have a question from louisa who's talking about i think in general um i think she might be called talking about the cold rooms do these encourage ripening or halt ripening entirely uh technologies uh, i think you know i'm just i guess I, you could talk about ripening in general in in a, in a cold room uh it would be the the, the question no, the idea, if uh, you saw in the slide, you see basically what we what we call call storage will slow down ripening, okay? But it's important if you, for example, you harvest in mangoes, you must harvest them at at least physiological maturity. That is important because the, the, we say the, the harvested fruit is living. It will continue to ripen if it is harvested at the right maturity. So what cold, cold storage does is to slow the ripening because we are slowing the ripening, for example, if you're looking for market, right? So of course, if you want the fruit, uh, you, I mean, if you, you, you are harvesting for immediate consumption, then you don't need to do cold storage, right? So, but if you say you're harvesting for later cells or you want to aggregate, like I said, the, the idea of having this at uh, aggregation or zero loss centers is because you're aggregating over time. So farmers are bringing in small quantities which you want to aggregate to attain a certain volume or a certain quantity for maybe a market that you're targeting. So that way it means you want to slow down the ripening so that's the essence of cold storage otherwise the fruits uh, if harvested at the right maturity it will continue to ripen of course ripe uh closer and remember mango is a tropical fruit so we don't store it at below 12 degrees c because of chilling injury so you see 12 degrees c does not sufficiently stop ripening it slows down ripening but the fruits eventually ripen okay Great. Thanks for thanks for the answer on, on that one. Um, uh, just turning to drying a bit. Um, uh, have, have, uh, I would imagine you have a lot of uh, different types of drying technologies, that are, um, but are there any kind of studies that you've done or you could share uh, related to maturation stages? Uh, it's uh, by Paul Viola. Okay, so uh, we've had, uh, there are some students who have conducted studies because uh, you see for, uh, for drying, you want the fruit to be farm ripe, okay? Remember mango, as it matures or rather as it ripens, uh, it becomes less acidic. When it is mature green, until it reaches optimal, it's acidic, okay? So when the fruits that we use uh, for ripening, they need to be ripe, but farm ripe, because remember you need to chip it and the chips need to be, you know, nice, nicely defined. So when you, if, of course, if you get an overripe uh, fruit, you cannot chip it nicely. So we go for the farm ripe fruit. So the students who have done, conducted some studies, you know, to look at, uh, you know, the effect of, um, you know, the ripening stage on or variety, on the quality of the chips, and you realize that these are, you know, these are, a state, and it also depends on the consumer. You know, there are consumers who like their chips a bit acidic, but there are consumers who like them just sweet with less acidity. So if you, you dry them earlier, because they need to be firm, they'll be a little bit acidic because of the acidity, because acidity disappears as the fruit ripens. They'll be a little acidic, but some people like them that way, okay? But uh, if you want them less acidic, then you want to age closer to that, uh, you know, full ripening, but not too ripe because then you cannot, the slices cannot be nicely defined as you'd want them. Because one of the things you have to do when you, you're packaging, you have dried your fruits and you want to package them, you don't want, uh, you know, the, the cause you remember mango is fibrous. Eh? So if you don't have the slices nicely defined, you'll have the edges which are not clean. Yeah, which again, it doesn't look good. So we, you, we basically, what we've done with the students is to, you know, we've achieved, you know that ripen, ripening stage, which is uh, gives you a quality uh, that is good, 
not too acidic and not too and not uh, too ripe for the you know for the chips not to be well defined. Okay, but of course, part of the research that we have done, uh, we they have tried to do is look at uh, uh, you know the pretreatments that you have to do to ensure that the quality is preserved. So that is a story for another day because you, there's some pretreatments you have to do to ensure that the quality and the color of the fruits is preserved. So that is also another study in itself. Um, great, thank you, thank you, Jane. Uh, we have a question here, and I know we're getting close to the hour mark, but we have a few more questions. So if we can, we'll, we'll just go a bit a bit longer here on the on the questions, if that's okay with you, Jane. Um, no problem. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so um, uh, we have a question here about basically about production interventions to to avoid trade offs, and they're basically saying um, because production challenges can derail the post production interventions. Um, what are the so talk a little bit about production, and I think this is basically around the the kind of the fruit fly and weevil issues that you 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 touched on. Yeah, sure. I think uh, maybe the, the 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 Simon probably came in after I had uh, done that bit, the, because, like I said, whatever happens in the field is important because uh, the nutrient management, water nutrient management, the pest and disease management, cultural practices, the impact, they affect the quality of the fruit. Okay, so for something like fruit fly, I already mentioned this. If the, we we do not manage the fruit fly in the field it is going to affect our fruit after harvest. And I shared my own experience of mangoes that I was given and half of them I threw because they had either the fruit fly or uh, they were infested by anthracnose, right? So uh, what we have done in these zero loss centers, the, the first one that we established in, in the place I, I called uh, Embu County, uh, we were working with the uh, extension people and uh, Technosav Kenya to be, uh, to be specific. And uh, the field officers from Technosav, what they are doing is to train farmers on how to manage, uh, you know, the fly, the fruit fly using the, you know, the fruit fly trap. So if you go to this region where this project uh, has been, you'll find that farmers have actually adopted the fruit fly trap as a way of money, because like I said, the fruit fly has actually cost us, Kenyan, it has cost us the export market. And I know uh, Rockefeller Foundation is working with uh, uh, USAID uh, to come up with, there's a campaign uh, to, to stop the fruit fly because it has cost us an, a lucrative market in Europe and US. So really it is important and it's part of the capacity building that is being done to ensure that farmers manage the pre-harvest component, whether it is the nutrient management, and we have students who have studied this, even calcium has an effect on the quality of the fruits. So I also have, I know there's a colleague in this in this meeting called Dr. Kitonio, and they are working on um, treatments like silicon in the field. And that has an impact on the, on the quality. So it is important, like I said, we ensure that whatever happens in the field gives us high quality, which then we preserve using these uh, post-harvest technologies. Great, th th great, great. Thank you for, for that answer. Um, uh, I have a, a quick question, and it's in, and I'm about. Um, we have a question about managing. Uh, can these technologies be used to manage it or control the post-harvest disease of? Oh man, I'm I'm I I can't really pronounce it. It's L I S I O D I P L O D I A. Um, and so I, I apologize for, for not being able to pronounce that word. Um, it, 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 I'm, you know, I'm not sure if you're, you know, you're the expert here, but go ahead. No, I, I actually didn't even understand the question. Okay. So. All right. Well, well, we, we, we'll get back to that person and see if we can, we can find a, find some, some, some answers on that. So, so, uh, uh, uh. Yeah, so we'll 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 get into that, and and we'll 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 talk offline with with that person. Um, and so, basically, I think uh, we have a we, we've gone through a whole bunch of questions here now, um, and so I'd just like to thank Jane, thank the participants. 
uh, again, I'd like to plug uh, both of the kind of the save the dates that Jane has outlined and they're on the screen right now. Uh, the third All Africa Post Harvest Congress and Exhibition, um, and uh, which will be September 13th to the 17th. That is a, a kind of hybrid event, right? Virtual and physical. Uh, yes. So, um, you know, hopefully we can, you know, that might be in a place where we can we can attend or maybe not. So, but uh, but we'll we'll be there virtually. Uh, at least, you know, the consortium will be there virtually. Uh, e either way, and Jane, I know, will be running around <laughs> no matter where she's at, get, get organizing there. For sure, and then um, uh, the five-day course uh, that uh, um, we will help Jane promote and and pull off as well. So, uh, um, Jane, is there any information about when uh, when people might receive that? Uh, um, so, um, uh, basically, we are working on the info package on. Uh, you know, so yeah, just watch the space. Um, I put the, some contact. I'll, uh, I have this, uh, I think I'll get this mailing list so that uh, we can, you know, uh, for, especially for the online theory course, it's, it's a learning course. So uh, if anybody's interested, they can plug in. So we'll be sharing this information. I think uh, Kyle, I'll get the contact emails of all the participants and then we can share these. So those who are interested can actually register and be part of the course. So we'll 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 distribute that to everyone who registered for the for this webinar. So that's wonderful. Um, uh, so additionally, on um, March 24th, we will be having another consortium webinar. That'll be two in the month of March. It'll be with our our friends and colleagues uh, from um, Izoki Log uh, in Brazil. Uh, so we are really looking forward to that. Uh, that presentation will be on. March 24th, same time, uh, and it will be a Zoom webinar. So again, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jane Ambuco uh, from the University of Nairobi. Thank you very much to the Rockefeller Foundation, the Foundation for Food and Agriculture Research, and everyone who's uh, participated in this webinar. I thought it was really excellent. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, and thank you all for joining the, the, the webinar. It was really an honor to speak to you all. And I want to believe you learned a theme or two. Let's keep talking about post-harvest loss reduction. Thank you so much. Uh, see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.